uh, I'd just like to mention, um, I had in another version of the slide presentation, uh, the logo for the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, which has supported uh, not only the Cantus database, but also the Cantus Ultimus project. So I would just like to acknowledge that uh, funding source. So far today, the papers have focused on data in the Cantus database, all of which has been entered, entered manually by a human who has consulted a manuscript page and entered information uh, from that page into the database. The data have been entered over a period of 30 years and have involved dozens of people and tens of thousands of hours. All data received two passes or two sets of eyes to ensure standardization and accuracy. Over the years, many innovations have increased the input speed. Certainly the move from punch cards in mainframes to various kinds of data collection software applications like Microsoft Access and Excel on personal computers increased speed drastically, and the next shift to an online input tool was transformative. Of course, with the increase in both speed and available storage space, we got greedier. Whereas in the 1990s, Chant researchers were thrilled to have access to catalogs that had just the metadata, with the feast day, an abbreviation for the office hour, an abbreviation for the genre, the beginning of every chant text, the mode and the differentia. Now we want full chant texts and melodies as well. With more data involved, we've needed even better input tools. And so a team of researchers has worked with Jan Kolacek, our software developer, to create more user-friendly options for entering data. For example, once the first chant text in a feast day is entered, if the feast is already in the system, the input tool suggests um, a number of possibilities for the next chant. If one of these is correct, with a couple of clicks, the manuscript reading full text field, the genre field, the Cantus ID, and the feast field auto-populate. And the researcher may have to adjust the text so that it reflects exactly the word order in the manuscript. If the next chant text isn't already in the system, the indexer has to enter it manually and assign, or the system assigns a Cantus ID number. We don't yet have this auto-populate option for melodies, because unlike texts, melodies do not yet have a melody ID assigned to them. A number of scholars have talked about how this might work, but there are still a number of details to work out. Meanwhile, we are coming at this idea of auto-population from another angle through the development of optical music recognition, or OMR. OMR is the musical equivalent of OCR, or optical character recognition, which allows you to search for words or a string of words in a corpus of digitized, um, manuscript, or digitized documents such as Google Books. So here, uh, I searched for Cantus database in Google Books, and there were 999 results. Um, including, you'll see the middle book there, is by Michael Allen Anderson, uh, our host for today. And if we click then on that source, uh, we can see the two places in a footnote where he acknowledged the Cantus database. Um, what we are in the process of doing is teaching the computer how to read plain chant manuscripts through optical music recognition. Once the computer can read the musical content in chant manuscripts accurately, all kinds of research possibilities will be open to us. Imagine being able to search melodies in the hundreds or thousands of digitized manuscripts, even if they haven't been manually cataloged or transcribed into a database. The biggest issue with OMR, though, is in ensuring accuracy. The handwriting in manuscripts, as opposed to print, is harder to teach computers to read. Even when the computer is reading print, the output can be garbled, as you can see here. Now this is the uh, Virginia Chronicle. Um, this is actually a, a crowdsourced project. And there's the original uh, newspaper letter, uh, newsletter maybe. Uh, on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see the output. Uh, and you can see it's not exactly English. Um, to ensure accuracy, uh, we need human editors uh, to correct what the machine has read. And in the case of the Virginia Chronicle, that is exactly how they are improving their data. It's a crowdsourcing project. And you can see that Barb, I don't think it's our Barb, but uh, is the top uh, text corrector. She's corrected 100 and 
54,301 lines of text. That's amazing. Um, if we want to increase the speed of data collection but simultaneously ensure quality and accuracy, we could use OMR to do a first reading of a melody, in other words, the first pass in the data collection, and a human would conduct the second pass, correcting any errors or misreading of these handmade documents. Even before we get to that stage, however, we can improve the OMR processing itself by using manual correction through the computer training process. Teaching the computer to read chant manuscripts involves two related but distinct tasks. The first task is to recognize musical symbols and group them with like symbols, and the second task is to assign meaning to those symbols. We will assign meaning through MEI, the Music Encoding Initiative, which is um, a relative of the Text Encoding um, Initiative, um, and we're con currently developing an MEI NUM module to do that. I won't spend time talking about assigning meaning today, but rather we'll focus on the recognition task instead. In the Cantus Ultimus and the Optical Noom recognition projects, we have processed two manuscripts already with musical notation at the chronological extremes of chant manuscript production. The 10th century St. Gall 390 and 391 using adiastomatic notation or Nooms without staff lines, and the 16th century Salzine Antiphonal, a manuscript like the Chicago Institute manuscript with cha uh, square chant notation on staff lines. In both cases, the processing involves isolating the musical symbols on every page and grouping them together by type. The computer had to be taught how to, at this stage, ignore text and decoration and focus on the musical notation itself. This process involves binarization, turning the manuscript images into black and white and removing all other elements, even the staff lines. The computer draws a box around each musical symbol and then has to identify it as a member of a group of like symbols. What the musicologists have learned through this process is that the computer cannot extrapolate relationships the way that a human can. And so we need to provide as much information upfront as possible. For example, Often at the beginning of a facsimile edition or a modern chant edition like the Liber Usualis, the editor will provide a list of nooms found in the edition. And uh, medieval scribes didn't do that. It would have been nice if they did. Uh, a human can see this list and note the pes or padatis and the climacus. And later, when a longer noom appears that combines elements of the two nooms, the human brain can understand without any particular instruction what this new noom means, even on a first encounter with that particular combination. The computer can locate components within a compound noom, but if you want the computer to identify the larger grouping, it has to be told that the compound noom is a new shape. For the researcher, the larger groupings are really important because within all chant notation styles, the grouping of pitches into compound nooms is linked directly to the text. Compound nooms are found over single syllables in the text. They are never spread over two or more syllables, so it's important that they are understood as individual entities. The problem in teaching the computer is that there are many, many ways of combining simple nooms into compound nooms, and so we need to find as many examples of these as we can. Here, for example, are some of the longer combinations we've found in the Salzine antiphonal. Similar to the compound noom issues, that even some of the simple nooms are made up of component, components of other simple nooms. In the St. Gall notation, notation, for example, the climacus is written as a virga and two puncti, and yet virgas appear on their own in other places, and so do puncti. We need the computer to distinguish between isolated virgas and puncti and the combined version of the climacus. In the Salzine notation, the climacus is written as a square punctum with two uh, diamond-shaped puncti, described as subpuncti, uh, that only ever appear descending at the end of a grouping. For this notation style, we need the computer to distinguish between the square punctum that appears on its own and the square punctum that appears as part of a group with subpuncti. This summer, developers at McGill, supervised by Ichiro Fujinaga and Gabriel uh, Villianzoni, created two web interfaces to work on varying levels of OMR training and correction. And they started with the notation in the Salzine Antiphonal. 
The first interface is a classifier, which trains the computer to find and group musical symbols, while the second is a correction interface to correct errors that still remain in the OMR output even after the training period. The classifier is critically important because it not only provides the computer with all of the symbols that it should be searching for, but it also provides the computer with hundreds of examples of each individual musical symbol. The computer has to have hundreds of examples because these documents are written by hand. While the human eye easily adjusts to slight differences in size, height, thickness, and density of pigmentation in the presentation of hundreds of square puncti, the computer has to be told that all of these slightly varied symbols belong in the same single category. And this is how the classifier works. Uh, so the on the bottom, you can see the binarized version of the manuscript page. Uh, the yellow uh, highlighted parts are um, the boxes drawn around the, each of the individual symbols. So those are things that the computer has identified as a potential symbol. And then in the top in green, those are symbols that a human has taken from the yellow list and, and uh, classified as a particular noom type, and so it's shown up in the green. I'm going to show you a little um, on-screen video so you can see how this classifier works. So I'm scrolling through the boxed symbols, and I've selected a Scandicus there, and you can see in the bottom in the binarized version there's a pink box there, and up on top I'm just showing you the, what, which ones we found on the left, I select it and the new Scandigus appears in the box. I'm going to do the same thing with a clivus. So I'm looking here. There's a clivus. And I want you to see on the bottom, you can see the little pink clivus there. Uh, and now, you don't have to scroll through this, but it's just fun to see it pop up. Um, and then I select it there and it shows up in the uh, top. To construct the classifier, we need to assign names to each symbol, but this naming exercise is really for the human, not for the computer. Some of the names might convey meaning, but again, this meaning is to help the human classify things. It is not how meaning will be assigned to the symbols for the computer. It is important to us that the naming system in this process is logical, though, so that um, the system used to create it could be replicated with each notation style that we classify, because we're going to have to do this with every notation style, this classification process. In the current trial classifier, we have a number of different groups of musical symbols. We have clefs and custos, divisions and neums, and we'll need to create other categories. In the Sol-Z notation, we have two types of clefs, F and C, and we only have C listed so far in this classifier. It's just uh, kind of the beginning stage. Um, and we also have a number of division markings. The kustos, um, which is marked with blue arrows here in uh, this slide, um, is an indication usually found at the end of a staff line, as you see on the far right, or sometimes before a cleft change. And you see that with that middle blue arrow. And it tells you what the next pitch will be and you can see those with the red arrows, that um, the, first, the first blue arrow is telling us that the next pitch is going to be a G, and then the cleft change happens, and then the next pitch is a G. So it tells you what it was in the first cleft, and now what it is in the second cleft. And then similarly, at the end of the staff line, um, it just helps somebody reading the manuscript to know that the next pitch on the next line is going to be an A. The category um, that concerns us the most, though, because of the number of members, um, is this uh, Noom category. And you can see some samples here in the trial classifier. Alessandra Iniesti at McGill, uh, she's a doctoral student there, has been working on a table to develop the Noom classifier for the Salzine and Tiffinol, and has come up with a very long list that we still need to incorporate into the classifier, including the 29 compound Nooms I shared earlier. After our new elements have been incorporated into the classifier and examples added, the new data will be fed then into the software um, and the computer learns through this process uh, and the computer will process the manuscript pages again and will add learning through the addition of new data every time. 
When the training process is complete, we still expect to have elements we have to correct. Uh, musical, ex musical symbols either not located, sometimes because of damaged pages, as we saw earlier, or faded ink, or that have been incorrectly identified. For the OMR output correction process, the McGill developers have created an OMR correction tool, which, similar to the Virginia Chronicle correction interface, will allow users to correct the OMR output. And this is what that tool looks like. So you can see um, here we've got, there are actually two overlaid images. So underneath is a kind of faded version of the original manuscript page, and then overlaid it on top is the OMR output. Um, and in the sample page, you can see that it hasn't got the clefts at the beginning of uh, three of those staff lines, which means it can't identify the nooms and the position of the nooms. Um, I'm going to show you another little video. Um, so here we've got two options up on top, edit or insert. Uh, I'm going to take an, uh, a C clef and insert it here. And uh, once I do that, uh, some of the nooms appear, but they're in the wrong spot. So now I'm moving them into the right place. We are hoping there won't be quite this many errors when we get to this stage, but um, the better the classifier, the better, the easier this process will be. And then there, the, um, there was a Kustos place where there should have been a division marking. So I just deleted it. And now I'm finding a, Kusto, a division marking. It's a minor division marking and I'm putting it on the staff there. So you can delete things or add things as necessary. While many people are uh, capable of correcting text from 19th and early 20th century newspapers, as we heard earlier, uh, correcting the OMR in this case will require some specific training and will be undertaken by research assistants at Dalhousie rather than by the general public. All of this work is well underway and we are getting much closer to the point where we will be able to use OMR generated data for our research as chance scholars. The question I would like to consider now, which will be the starting point for Kate Helson's talk to follow, is what will we do with the data sets, data sets once we have them? The repertory of medieval chant is sprawling and involves the reuse of texts and melodies in many ways, as we also just heard from Sarah Long. This intertextuality is hard to track because the data, the chant texts and music, are preserved in manuscripts held in libraries and private collections around the world, and each of these manuscripts is unique. Being able to more easily trace the reuse of texts and melodies through this vast manuscript repertory would add significantly to our understanding about the transmission of medieval culture more broadly and about the movement of people and ideas throughout Eastern and Western Europe and the British Isles and even later to colonies in North and South America. We've got a manuscript in Chicago, we've got a manuscript in Halifax, they're all over the place, and Australia. Scholars since the 19th century have been creating resources for research into this repertoire through printed catalogs, indices, facsimile editions, microfilms of manuscripts, and modern editions of texts. All of these materials are useful, but gathering them and searching them manually is a long and laborious process, often akin to searching for a needle in a haystack. Digitized manuscripts and online databases solve this problem. They are proven to be efficient tools for uncovering the intertextuality that so permeates medieval literate culture. Uncovering networks of intertextuality will expand our knowledge deeply about how and where information traveled throughout the medieval period. And digital tools are improving rapidly. In 2008, for example, and I'm going to do a similar case study, I published an article uh, on late chant style in the Journal of Music Theory. Part of the article focuses on a fragmentary office for St. Rock found in the Salzine Antiphonal. Uh, the 13th century St. Rock was born in Montpellier but was very popular in the Low Countries from the 14th century on, and it was unclear if his office originated in the Low Countries or in Southern Europe. I searched extensively for the St. Rock chant, Confessor Dei Venerande Obtinuit, but could not find the text anywhere else. The online Cantus database did not have the text, 
<clears throat> nor did the 55 volume Analecta Hymnica uh, published by Guido Maria Draves from 1886 to 1922. Various other online searches and direct emails to a number of scholars in the field yielded no further results, and I concluded in print that Confessor Dei appears to be a unica in the Salzine Antiphonal, not appearing in any other source. Now, nine years later, as part of the process to develop OMR, research assistants are manually transcribing chant melodies from manuscripts into the Cantus database. As Barbara mentioned earlier, the goal of the manual transcription is to create ground truth to compare to the output generated by the OMR process, and that is going to be another part of the computer training. But the data compiled are already fully searchable and now comprise a substantial corpus. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, research assistants uh, working on the Cantus Ultimus project at Dalhousie and at the University of Waterloo and at McGill have entered 32,000 chant melodies and 52,000 chant texts and edited 26,000 melodies and 46,000 texts. The text for Confessor Dei Venerande Obtinui still does not show up in any other manuscript in the Cantus database, but now melodies are searchable as well. And it turns out that there are 53 chants that begin with the same musical phrase at the same pitch level, including two in the Salzine Antiphonal, which has the St. Rock chant. Um, even though I had access to this manuscript, I was not able to locate these other instances in the 2,052 chant melodies contained in that single book, let alone find them buried in other manuscripts. Without this digital tool, it might have taken me a lifetime to find these other 53 chants that begin with the same melody. A cursory analysis of the other texts that use this melody shows that it is reused primarily for other male saints, including Nicholas, Benedict, Semperti, who is the Bishop of Augsburg, Morris and his companions, and for four other saints popular in northern France and or the Low Countries, St. Lambert, who is the Bishop of Maastricht, St. Willibrord, Bishop of Utrecht, St. Babulanus, Abbot of St. Peter's near Paris, and St. Eligius, the Bishop of Noyon and Tournai. With further comparison and analysis, considering the dating of the manuscripts in which the melody is found, it may now be possible to work out the origin and transmission of St. Rock's office, something that would have been impossible without being able to easily search from a number of manuscripts that have had their melodies transcribed into the Cantus database. Optical music recognition eventually will add hundreds of thousands of melodies for us to search. Thank you.